And if everyone else can just turn their cameras off until it's the time to either present or be on the panel, that'd be great. Okay, Tim, ready whenever you are. I'm going to let them in now. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, pleasure that you're able to join us for uh, the last day of these virtual missions that we've been running over the summer. Um, we'll just wait a few more moments just while everyone uh, joins, just to make sure we have a full house before we um, smart. So we'll just give it one more moment. Well, hello. I think we will we'll make a start. So my name's Tim Mester. I work for the KTN and I lead on the Agri-Food Africa uh, programme. This is sort of uh, my main area of focus. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session. It's the last day of our virtual missions, which we've been running over the summer. And um, we're delighted that we've got some fantastic panellists this morning with us to talk about um, livestock and um, we will start the discussion shortly. Just a few uh, points just to mention. Firstly, this recording of this first session, this first 30 minute discussion that will be available on YouTube. So uh, you will have access to this content um, later on. If I could ask those that aren't presenting um, or aren't, aren't a panelist, if you could mute, keep yourself muted and turn off your camera. Um, that just helps with um, the the bandwidth, um, and then we will sort of jump into the, the session. You can, if you did want to ask questions, uh, you can do that. Just type them into the chat. It's helpful if you can address them to the person you're asking, just so we know um, what uh, what it's about, and and also just where you're from. Uh, give us some context, basically, to work from. That will be really helpful. So. What we'll do is we'll I'll, I'll ask each of the presenters to uh, to introduce themselves, and um, then we will sort of start the discussion. So could I go first to Jamie, um, who's based up in Edinburgh? Would you uh, just give us a brief introduction to yourself, please, Jamie? Uh, hi, Tim. Thank you. Welcome all to the session. My name is Jamie Suarez. I work as a researcher at the University of Edinburgh, and I'm actually working in in a SEVI, which stands for Supporting Evidence-Based Interventions. We are funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and we are trying to collate information in livestock in Africa to, let's say, improve or decrease the mortality in some countries in Africa. Uh, my background is animal science. I hold a PhD in animal production and also a master's degree. And on top of that, I did a specialization in international development. So that's me. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Jamie. That's fantastic. Um, Ross and Nicole, would you, uh, Nicolette, would you mind introducing yourselves now? Yeah, um, Nicolette and I, we're a husband and wife team. Um, we, we both dairy farmers in South Africa and uh, we, we run a business called Danmoz in Mozambique. Uh, we're a dairy processing factory there that produces um, yogurts and cheeses primarily for the, the, the low end of the market. And uh, yes, um, I'm a holder of a BSc in, in soil science and chemistry and uh, Nicolette's the holder of a BCom um, management accounting. Thanks, thanks very much for that. And we should mention as well that they're in a uh, milking parlour at the moment, so authentic, <laughs> which we liked. Um, yeah. so, uh, could I ask uh, Tim uh, to introduce himself now? Hi, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Tim Byrne. I'm from a firm called Abacus Bio. Uh, we are a uh, uh, agribusiness consultancy uh, firm providing products and services uh, right across the agricultural 
uh, supply chain uh, landscape. Um, uh, I hold a PhD in quantitative genetics and we have a, a strong capability in our company uh, to handle data and um, support decision making from that data in livestock systems. Um, and I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Thanks. We'll try not to get too confused with the two Tims on the on this session as well. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll have about 25 minutes of questions. If you want to ask questions to our panelists, then do type them into the chat and we will see if we can get to them. Uh, and then we'll break we'll we'll go into sort of breakout rooms where we can you can add your input to this discussion. So the first uh, challenge I, uh, first sorry, first question I have has the word challenge in it. Um, and it's uh, a broad question, but I think it will um, direct us towards some of the key areas that we want to talk about today. So um, I'll start uh, with, with Jamie. Um, so the first question is, and I'll ask all the panelists for their input on this one. So what are the, some of the key challenges and opportunities affecting the livestock industry in sub-Saharan Africa? So a big, very big question, but Jamie, if you'd care to have a, a go at answering that, that'd be great. Uh, yes, of course. I think that one of the main things in livestock production is the, the lack of management practices from, from the beginning to the end of the, um, of, the, of the chain. I think that we need more raw data and raw data not for, um, not for um, raw data for improving a key performance indicators into the farm and also to, uh, to improve productivity. Uh, because this is, a, this is one of the other challenges. Animal has a lot of poor productivity because of reproduction problems and that uh, scales up to lacking reproduction. That means that, that they are going to be really bad producing, you know, um, offspring, offspring and, and, and of course, uh, it's just a productivity uh, problem. And I believe that training, training from the livestock uh, farmers is uh, another challenge. They have, uh, they are not trained at all and they do have some believings that they, you know, conduct their own practices when, while uh, rearing animals. So I believe that we have to respect that. We must respect that kind of cultural, uh, you know, background, but we also need some training. And of course, another of the problem is the, housing much of the, the dairy animals in, in some countries in Africa, they are kept on sheds their entire life. While, you know, they are ruminants, they need to walk, they need to, uh, to eat. So yeah, for me, those are the, the challenges and the opportunities. I think that cooperativism and association is one of the biggest opportunities in the sector. And also the creation of public and private a partnership could be very useful. And I think that they can learn from our mistakes here in the, you know, in the, in the developed countries. So I think that if they don't follow us closely uh, the practices that we have been, you know, putting into the livestock, I think that they will be, um, and they, they, could, they could learn from our mistakes and, and so not repeat it. So that's Thank you. Me. No, thanks, Jamie. That's a very um, good, good, good start to that to that big question. Um, could, could I come to Tim on that one next? Would you care to have a give us your thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm going to take, a, I guess, a slightly more business perspective to it, um, and I think a few look through the eyes of the smallholder farmer. Um, one thing that they're lacking is access to stable, informed markets. So um, they, they aren't sure of the price they're going to receive. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about uh, whether they'll be able to trade their livestock. And what that means is that they are exposed to actually a lot of risk. And because of that risk, they, they can't make decisions that have a long-term time frame. They're forced to make short-term decisions to, to manage risk effectively. 
and if you are making short-term decisions then then you're not planning for the long term and you don't invest in long-term outcomes and that lack of investment then feeds into uh, into kind of a cycle of short-term decision making and um, and a highly risky uh, business effectively um, and I guess therefore the opportunity is to is for us as a as a collective to focus on kind of models that support stability across the supply chain and and support market stability because if a smallholder farmers have some view of what price they might receive for their product and how that price might be linked to the quality of it, then they can expand their their decision making time frame to be more long term, remove some of the risk from the things they do and and therefore make decisions that uh, mean they can make more money from their business and plan long term. Thank you for that insight, Tim. Yeah, I, uh, very interesting actually um, to see it from that perspective. And uh, perhaps we can go now to um, Ross. Uh, and, and, you know, you've got obviously a, a different uh, perspective on this being um, one of those um, producers. So c would you care to tell us your thoughts on this question? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, I think uh, to hit the nail on the head as well, the definitely from a holistic point of view, um, that access to markets is, is critical. Um, I, I just like to start on opportunities, and uh, I think that uh, we mustn't lose sight of that. I think Africa, uh, in terms of the the, the sheer amount of um, fertile agricultural ground, is is incredible, and uh, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there's certainly rainfall available in most of sub-Saharan Africa, by a few places, and uh, the soil type is, is generally good um, when one compares it to other parts of the world. So I think the, the, the fundamentals are there from um, when an agricultural looks at rainfall and soil, that, that's in place. The challenges um, certainly agree with uh, 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 Jimmy in terms of um, uh, education, stockmanship, and I might contradict myself a little bit here, um, there's uh, it's chalk and cheese between the, the genetics that occurs um, in Africa and um, you know it's either very westernized um, genetics of cattle which aren't accustomed to the African conditions or the exact opposite where um, there's, there's no breeding at all and uh, weight gain or milk production is thus sacrificed so I think the the sweet spot is, is somewhere in the middle um, where, the, where one can introduce a few Western genetics into the local population. Um, and then the other challenge is, is uh, winter and drought feed for cattle. Um, this is where I'm going to contradict myself. Is, you know, I was always told that um, animal production is 80% is feeding and 20% and breeding. Um, and uh, every time I, I look around, come winter time, wherever I am in Africa, the animals are, are all having a battle and whatever condition they put on in the summer months when there was some rain, um, they, they lose a lot of it in the winter months and that affects one condition and conception rates. So it's a case of uh, three steps forward, two, two steps back. And then when you go through a, a El Nino or drought conditions, then it's uh, three steps forward, um, four steps back. So that couples with the education in, in conserving feed and silent feed and uh, one's understanding of, uh, of, a, of an animal as well. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Um, that was helpful. Uh, you mentioned quite a few things in there, which uh, were some of the questions we wanted to ask. And uh, perhaps we'll pick up on um, one of these, which is uh, this idea of uh, Having to bit to 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 breed desirable regional traits into local livestock, um, and how that's you know we we don't want to just take the uh, genetic traits from Western countries where they are you know they're bred for those for those conditions, and put them straight into uh, conditions which might not be appropriate for them. So um, I guess it's starting perhaps with uh, Tim on this one. How do you see? Um, the importance of this, you know, what's being done, how can we improve on this, do you think, Tim? How important is this? Um, and if you mind putting your camera on as well when you ask, when you answer, that'd be great. 
Can you repeat the question, please, Tim? Yeah, just how, I guess, how important do you think breeding desirable? I was muted then. How, how important is it to breed desirable regional traits into? Yeah. Um, well, it's obviously hugely important. But um, I think it maybe relates to the, the next question on your list there is that you can't just breed uh, traits in isolation. You have to consider how they manifest in the local environment. So uh, there are plenty of examples of um, exotic genetics being brought to, to sub-Saharan Africa and them failing because they're not, uh, they're not suited to the environment. They don't, they don't, um, they're not offered with the feeding and animal health system that comes with it. And so I, don't, I just, I don't think we can rely on imported genetics to, to deliver what's required for, for the sub-Saharan African environment. We have to work on generating a genetics product that is tailored more to the environment, but then equally we have to provide that genetics product with the tools to, to make the most of it. So, if you're going to put, if you're going to breed an animal that produces 30% more milk or 10% more meat, then there has to be the management system, the animal health system, and the training to go with it, so that actually the genetics can can deliver. Thanks for that, Tim. And uh, coming over to, to Jamie, um, uh, you know, is that a do you, how do you how important do you think it is would you care to sort of elaborate on that in terms of uh, local traits? Uh, yeah, of course. I totally agree with him. I think that uh, genetics in in the developed countries has been very useful for some traits, but for others, there are just you know a waste of time. I totally agree with Tim, and I think that I'm gonna put here an example. Uh, just a student just graduated from the university and his phd started just you know in in trying of have a conversation with farmers about which or what traits they 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 wanted and they basically said in kenya and tanzania that they rather have resilient you know cattle dairy cattle breeds rather than highly productive uh, cattle breeds so when you start speaking with the community, I think that this is one of the approach that we should um, we should have when we are talking about genetic improvement. I think that the that the farmers have, have their own input, and we should respect somehow, you know, the 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 genetics and the and the and the and the breeds that are down there because they have thrived over years. So I yes, I believe that we should uh, have some genetic improvement, but we also should consider, you know, the resilience of these breeds. Thank you. Thanks for that, um, JB. Um, uh, and perhaps Ross, do you want to? Uh, I mean, you've sort of mentioned this briefly. Um, do you want to sort of elaborate on that and how that impacts on you? And uh, what are you doing, uh, sort of, in your context to sort of uh, tackle this issue? Yeah. Um, how much time do you have, Tim? I, it's been a few. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> big questions. I'll I'll surmise. Um, yeah. So from from two aspects. So so we um, we're the only commercial dairy farm um, in Mozambique, and uh, what we've done from a commercial point of view is we've used um, uh, there's a, a gene. Um, I don't know if you guys are favourite called the slick gene, and uh, we've incorporated that into our dairy herd, and it's basically a, a single gene responsible for the thermoregulation of dairy cattle and uh, the, the enemy of, of all dairy cows in Africa is, is nine times out of ten the, the heat um, and uh, we've incorporated this gene into our herd and uh, we, we're finding um, that the, those carriers those animals or carriers of those genes are, are produce significantly more milk and, uh, and, and conceive earlier just because of, of uh, the less stress that they are exposed to. Um, so what we've, we've taken a step further than that in the concepts of the small scale farmer is um, we've, we've crossbred a lot of our, we've got a Jersey herd um, on the farm and um, we've used um, Bos Indicus semen on the dairy herd uh, for the animals we don't need for replacements. 
and uh, the progeny of those cattle are 50% Jersey, 50% uh, by syndicate, whether it be a, a Brahmin or an Nguni or some local breeds. And uh, those are the animals that are now sought after by the local population. We've, uh, we sell them uh, quite extensively around Mozambique and uh, it's, uh, that animal is just so much more resistant to the uh, temperature, to tick-borne diseases, and uh, they just last a lot more. So um, the byproduct is that is the, there's eventually um, some net increase in the in the size of the national herd. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm quite passionate about the genetics, but um, you know the other the other important thing is I mentioned earlier is, is ensilment of, of feed during winter. And, um, you know, there's some basic techniques that I think uh, a lot of uh, small scale farmers could benefit from um, if they were schooled in, in, in those ways. Thanks for that. That's a, a good insight, I think, into your situation. And uh, I just want to talk a bit about markets now, if possible. And um, I spent some time in Tanzania and one of the, uh, eye-opening moments for me was just uh, recognizing so for instance that you know any chicken that was consumed most of that was imported from Brazil uh, you know frozen produce um, but that was despite there being a lot of uh, local chickens running around and so I, I guess the, the question sort of stems from that which is you know how can local livestock production compete with cost-effective imports um, you know, that's that's one example of that. So uh, perhaps Tim would pick this up for us to start with. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Uh, if you look at the way globalization's worked, um, you know, outsourcing IT, outsourcing food production, um, outsourcing call centers, you know, it's the way it's the way the world's gone. So you could ask the question: Well, if it, if grain can be produced cheaper in Canada, then why don't uh, why don't we just import grain into into sub-Saharan Africa? Um, but what I think what I think needs to be done is some sustainability. Is 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 you know the the answer is built around the need for sustainability and self-sufficiency in sub-Saharan Africa. So we've seen during things like We've seen during COVID the fragility of the globalized food supply chain. So I think there's an argument for for sub-Saharan Africa to have some self-sufficiency. Um, and there's examples of it happening. So there's companies like Ethio Chicken who who are successfully, um, you know, producing um, genetically improved chickens and providing them locally uh, in market. So it's not an easy thing to overcome, given given the cost structures and, and inefficiencies in a place like Sub-Saharan Africa, compared to places where food might be able to be produced cheaper. Uh, but I think it's something we have to do. We have to um, ensure that there's some self-sufficiency in in that part of the world, and and build business models that can that can deliver that. Thanks, Tim, for that answer. And perhaps Jamie, you wouldn't mind picking this up now and, and sharing your thoughts on this one. Yes, I think that it's very difficult to compete with prices, as Tim mentioned, you know, the, uh, the, the, the first world produces grains at, at pennies, so it is very difficult. But what I've seen is that maybe a sub-Saharan African livestock and, and producers can become, or become organic producers. And this is a great market for people in Africa and in Latin America, if we follow, for example, the markets in Colombia, where the coffee um, producers just associate the made cooperatives and, and then, you know, export the products. And, you know, this is a, a way forward. I think that if you can invest or if we can invest in trying to, to become organic or some kind of brand that helps, you know, to recognize this as this is a, a, um, a product from my country and I wanted to, 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 you know, to consume that. So that could be a, a great opportunity for the smallholder farmers to, to create a brand from, from themselves. So I guess it's, it's that piece, isn't it, of looking at the market um, and uh, trying to carve out your own space um, for, your, for your products. And I know that, exactly. I mean, certainly that's a lot of what um, 
you've been doing, um, Ross and Nicolette, and your um, production, perhaps you'd care to comment on this. You know, how do you, can you compete or how do you compete with international markets? Um, I don't know if the right answer is um, increased tariffs <laughs> <laughs> on imports. Uh, well, it, the, the solution is, is simple. Uh, you know, one just has to become more efficient. Um, that's the only way I see it. Or as, uh, as, as Jamie said, differentiate your product um, as it's from a local, um, a local source. Um, those are the only two ways I, I see it. I don't think um, uh, the problem is going to get any, uh, any, any better going forward. Um, it's down to each individual uh, process and producer in that country to, to optimize their own processing techniques and, and become as efficient as possible. And, Get that through education and, uh, and technology. Thank you. And uh, I guess we've we've sort of running out of time um, on this um, section. But um, one of the things that I guess that comes off the off the side of that in terms of markets is just that the the different there's huge differences in how livestock are pr processed, uh, quality control issues, welfare standards uh, for different markets. How how can you sort of tar um, marry these two together where there are these big differences um, in markets. Um, Tim, perhaps you'd care to comment first on this one. Yeah, I think uh, we, we have to offer uh, solutions uh, locally that uh, address uh, all elements of the supply chain. So there's no point chucking genetics in there um, and expecting it to deliver. You can't just build a flash processing facility and then say you've got you know quality standards organized so it needs to be kind of a systems based approach to to developing these um developing the livestock sector and if we take a systems based approach it's not easy but if we take a systems based approach then you know there will be ways in which we can uh, lift the the whole production system so that it delivers on um you know product quality and is is an in, in elastic market so that you know in in commodity cycles you know the products hold their hold their price you know and branding's important it's not it's not going to be easy to do but we do need a systems based approach to lift lift the the supply chains and in doing that then the products produced locally become more competitive, they become um, desirable and and there's an informed and and you know quality market behind it so that farmers can get the prices they deserve for, for their investment. Yeah, thanks for that, Tim. And, and um, just to add my penny's worth here, I think uh, I can really see how this is an important component. And uh, if you take the example, say, of Uganda, where they um, big Nile perch industry, you know, fishing industry, um, and they exported a lot of that to the EU, uh, who weren't very happy with the standards being produced. And so they um, shut down uh, exports for a period. Um, and so the government had to radically change how they were processing that Nile perch. But the knock on it, uh, you know, builds lots of infrastructure and, and local training and that sort of thing. But the knock on effect, actually, interesting enough, has been that it's really benefited the 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 emerging aquaculture industry because suddenly they've got a lot of expertise uh, and resource and infrastructure regionally which they didn't have before so i think looking uh, more broadly um is is very important um so a systems approach yeah, I, I totally can see how that's important um we sort of run out of time now and um, maybe we'll, we'll finish with a bit of a fun question in a sense someone asked earlier on um whether insects are livestock um does anybody, anyone care to, uh, to Jamie? What, what are your views? Are insects livestock or not? Um, I think that they could become <laughs> being like <laughs> livestock. I think that they are becoming important, especially as a as a source for feed in animals. Mm -hmm. But I I wouldn't consider it like right now as a as a livestock. But maybe maybe it okay. could. Yeah, it could it it could come. <laughs> How about you, Ross? What do you think? Are insects livestock? Are you going to start a, a cricket production? 
Yeah, um, it's a little bit uh, out of left field, but uh, certainly I'm sure there's merit. Uh, time will tell whether it gains traction or not, um, but not right now. <laughs> no, no, thanks. So we're going to um, break off into our discussion rooms now. Um, so you'll go to smaller rooms. Um, you'll have a host who will ask ask you some questions and uh, which will be recorded this session um, so that we can feed back into the program that won't be available on YouTube those recordings so don't worry um, and then uh, we will come back shortly just so I can thank everybody and we'll go on our way for the rest of the day so um, if Aileen would uh, break us up into groups that would be fantastic